वेलकम एवरी वन माई नेम इज़ अश्वनी कुमार आई टीच हेयर एट द माउंट इन द फैकल्टी ऑफ एजुकेशन एंड आई हैव ऑर्गनाइज दिस पैनल विद द हेल्प ऑफ माई फॉर्मर स्टूडेंट्स हेयर दिस पैनल इज़ अबाउट होलिस्टिक एजुकेशन दिस इज माई एरिया ऑफ रिसर्च एंड आई ऑल्सो ऑफर कोर्सेज एट द माउंट इन दिस एरिया एट ग्रेजुएट लेवल एज वेल एज एट द अंडर ग्रेजुएट लेवल द मेन focus of holistic education is self inquiry that is the most significant principle so education is not about information education is just not necessarily about information is not about just standards and outcomes and measurements and competition but it is essentially about understanding yourself and your relationship to the rest of the world to the human beings and to the nature and we go into this self inquiry through something which i would like to call meditative inquiry in a dialogical space so we uh, me and my students create a dialogical space in our class to explore ourselves and our relationship to the world and to see education not just as a knowledge based dimension where i transmit knowledge to them they acquire it and they reproduce it but something that is life transformative something that is creative that is intelligent and that is also creative uh, critical so it's a very holistic and deeper view of education uh these panelists they have studied with me uh, i will introduce them briefly and then they can introduce themselves each of them will speak for about 5 to 7 minutes and uh, then we can have a little bit of time for discussion afterwards so this is charlotte charlotte is an art educator michelle is a teacher in truro and nancy she is is a consultant she provides lots of uh, advice on education and she has worked for a long uh, time in the area of first nation education sean doyle is a teacher with hrsb and erica philips is also a teacher with hrsb thanks i'd i'd like to maybe just touch on what I've gained from uh, look exploring holistic education and how it's impacted me as a person but also as a teacher. Um when when I first got into uh my master's program I was shocked by the holistic education class because it was the first class I took and it was very much as Ashwani has already described um very much exploratory and based on dialogue and so for what stood out to me was the exploration and finding out if what you're hearing and talking about is true finding it out for yourself and that exploration uh impacted me as a person because i was able to look at i guess what's behind the things i do on a daily basis um the relationships that i I encounter every day but also the ones that um uh, encounter me every day so uh I be felt that I've become more of a um, I don't want to say better but uh a more involved parent uh the relationship with my my child my son has grown um because rather than trying to mold him into um what a I want him to be or b what I don't want him to be um uh i've allowed him to grow and and all of that has come from the exploration that i've done into myself um why am i looking to do these things to my own child right and it's because of insecurities and things like that that we all possess um and the relationships that i have with my child and my wife and everything else like that has grown uh because of the self exploration that i've done um and taking that into the classroom um i guess the biggest impact that the tad on the classroom is um rather than trying to pass on what um i know as a a writer or a reader in the english language arts classroom um shifting the focus away from me to my students um giving them the attention the focus allowing them to explore themselves um and then just kind of allowing setting up the environment where they can just do that and be um 
taking some of the dialogue and the discussion um, and using it into the in the classroom to allow them that opportunity because they don't get that much opportunity to explore who they are, uh, to explore what they're interested in um, in the in the land of outcomes and um, and whatnot. So. That all has had a major impact on classroom management as a teacher. Um, previously, I was, when I first started teaching, I was a bit of an alpha male, and it was, you know, it's gonna be my way because I will win every time. Um, but oddly, now classroom management has become even easier because I don't compete anymore. I'm not, uh, all of my nightmares, and if there are any teachers in the room, the end of August always comes with a lot of nightmares about <laughs> school starting and, and whatnot and the insecurity that, you know, what if they never listen or whatever and all this stuff. Um, and that's gone because it's not a competition in my classroom. My students feel safer um, because I've been able to explore what's behind my motivations. Um, and through myself, I understand them better. And that's all students really want is to be understood. Um, and at a younger age, I teach junior high, at a younger age, they just need the opportunity and the guidance to be able to do that. Um, so without taking up too much time from everybody else, um, but that's in a nutshell what um, taking holistic education uh, has meant for me. It's allowed my students, myself, my family to grow as human beings rather than just sponges of information. I'm Erica Phillips, and I'm currently teaching grades three, four at an elementary school in Halifax. Um, it's only my second year back down into the little kids. Um, I was a junior high teacher, a grade nine teacher for the last five years. So it was a big shift in doing that, and I think that shift actually became a little bit easier because the last year of my grade nine teaching was when I took this course in holistic and learning about the childhood and the creativity and kids really like school when they're really little and how they lose that by the time they're in junior high and high school. So what is it? Is it school that's doing that? Is school the one that is doing that because we have these outcomes in the curriculum that we have to follow? And again, me being the front of the classroom and you have to do it this way and I know everything and I'm going to give you all my knowledge. And that last year in my grade nine class, I would often take back our dialogue discussion points that we were doing in our class and ask the same thing of my students, because the grade nines, I knew that they could handle it. So I asked them just the question, what is curriculum? And trying to get what the kids think curriculum is, because I, as a teacher, know curriculum is not something I design. It's given to me, and I have to implement it. But my students thought I picked it. They thought I picked the subjects, I picked the courses, I picked what they have to learn, and they don't like when they think you're picking and they don't get to have a say. So even having that conversation with them about this is you know, a bigger piece of a puzzle, and I have to implement, and it's not always my favorite subject, but if we can make it fun and we can make it engaging together, then that was a big thing. And the biggest thing for me with the holistic, I am no longer the most important thing in the room. And I don't think I ever really was, I've always loved my students, but I'm not at the front of the classroom anymore. I'm barely ever at the front of the classroom. I've even used technology to make it so my kids are at the front of the classroom. I have a little point of view camera, and I always point it at a table group, and that's projecting on the LCD projector. So when we're doing a task, there's a different group each day projected at the front of the class so they feel like they're the leaders. And letting the students have that, and it was the best thing. I wrote in a paper that I wrote for Ashwani. I said, I felt like now I'm not that focused anymore. I feel like I'm more of a facilitator. And he says, why are you a facilitator? Why are you not a co-learner? And then I was like, you're right. I learn more from my students every day, I think, than they realize. And that relationship that you have, that you grow with them and we learn together. And when we don't know as teachers, it's okay to say we don't know. How can we figure that out? What can we go to? Nowadays, we got Google. You can Google it. But kids are still going to need school and they still need that, that environment that is, as Sean said, safe and welcoming and trusting <coughs> and that they can be a part of. And my students now, when I switch to elementary, I will say that was a huge change for me. They only come up to my hip. They like to hug and touch you, and grade nines don't. <laughs> um, and threatening to have them hold your hand, they want to. So that's a whole different ball game when you go down to the little ones. But I just saw the eagerness in these little kids and was like, how can we keep that going? How can we keep them loving school? And this year I had a couple kids that didn't really like to read at the beginning of the year, and I said, you just haven't found the right book. 
Because once you find, and there's so much out there, and I remember I read a book, and I don't know if some people might know it or not know it. I read The One and Only Ivan to my students. And at the end of it, I read it as a read aloud. So the students did not read this book. I read it. The last day, the last page when I closed it, I had a student come up to me, that's the best book I've ever read. He didn't even read it. We read it as a class. But just finding that book, and then afterwards he said, can I have that book? Can I take that book? And I know the reading level was probably a little bit above him, but because we had read it together, I knew that he would understand more. And I said, sure, you can have that, and you can take that with you and, and go. And so just finding those things and picking. And this year I found out I have four of the same kids in my class. I can't do anything that I did last year. I know some people would say, you're going to do some of the same lessons. No, I won't. Because I want to give them a different experience. And so even my first book of the year, I can't even do that book. I had to, this summer, I had to reach out to other colleagues and find other books that I'm excited too, because they're books that I don't necessarily know. And so I've been reading all summer, the, the year of Billy Miller and all of these things, trying to get ready for these new novels to make it a new experience for me and them. And I think that's a huge thing. One thing that we watched, it was a little YouTube video clip um, from Satish Kumar, and it was about apple seeds and potential. And for the last two years, I've done this with my students. So I bring in an apple, we break it open, and inside there's an apple seed, and we talk about what is an apple seed. And they're like, it's an apple seed. But I was like, is that all it is? Is it just a seed? What can it be? What could it be? And then they start going, and they're like, well, I guess it could grow into a tree. And you're like, yeah, and what else? Well, it could produce apples. How many apples? Year after year after year. And it's to talk to them about the potential. All the kids in my class are my little apple seeds. And that first day, I take one apple seed, and I put it in a little tiny Ziploc baggie, and I stick it to my whiteboard. And I ask them, what's going to happen to that apple seed? And the kids say, nothing. And I said, why not? Because Apple seeds need to have water and soil and sunlight, and it's trapped in a little baggie. It's not going to do anything. I'm like, so what's it going to do? It's not going to reach its potential. But if we were to plant it and take care of it, might it become an apple tree? And they say yes, but it might not. We might forget to water it. We might not give it enough sunlight, or it might just not grow. My class last year in September, we ate a whole bunch of valley apples and we collected all the seeds. And there's quite a process involved with apple seeds. We had to dry them. Then we had to make them be dormant in the refrigerator for two and a half months to simulate winter. Then we had to put them in paper towel and let them sprout. Then we had them all, and they were just so excited when they saw that little sprout. And they planted them. And every student got to plant two apple seeds, and they started to grow. And it was a life cycle thing. It did tie to curriculum. It was, you know, the life cycle of the plant, and they were doing this. And then they got to take them home. And they all know that they're my little apple seeds. And I am so excited because I did the apple seed thing at the same time as them. Now, I know some of them said their apple seed died because they took it home and put it in the closet and forgot about it. But I've kept my apple seed. I'm priding myself taking this in the first day of school to show my students from last year. It's as tall as me. And I only started it. It only got planted into soil the day after, well, two days after March break because that Monday was a snow day. The day after we went back, that's when they got planted, and it is now as tall as me. And I want to show them, but that is me. I like set timers on my phone to remind myself that I need to water it because I want to make sure I'm giving that everything I can, and that's like what I need to do with my students, give them everything we have and show them that that's their potential. Okay. My name's Nancy McLeod. I'm not used to mics. Um, I worked in First Nations education for about 30 years. I don't want to date myself, but I'm going to say hi to Kathy Martin over there. I just noticed um, she was here. She's, uh, she was my boss um, in 1988, one of the best jobs I ever had. Um, she, did, she was the boss, but she wouldn't say, um, you know, what did you do? She would say, what did you need? Do you need anything? Do you need any more supplies? Do you need? And I said, well, I, I have to go to that meeting in Halifax, and I lost my license for speeding. She said, well, I'll just send you an airline ticket. So that, she was a pretty good boss. <laughs> um, so 
my experience, I, I believe my experience has given me, uh, taught me more than, than anything because I was working in a culture other than my own. I worked in um, Manitoba and Ontario with the Cree and also with the Mi'kmaq in Nova Scotia for a long time as a teacher, uh, vice principal, principal, and most recently as director of education. So I left um, my position in 2013 and, and came here to do my master's. Um, I'm as old as the professors. Um, I, most people that I've worked with went to do their master's shortly after uh, they were teaching, but um, I didn't do that. So working with First Nations, when I, when I started looking at my, the course list, when I saw holistic education, uh, that drew me in um, quickly as, um, Given my experience, we were always looking at how things were interrelated when you work with First Nations cultures, as opposed to the, the linear uh, way of looking at things, which divides things up. So I thought, well, that should be relevant, and, and um, I should be able to relate to it very well, given my experience in the communities. And it actually, it did. Uh, the only thing is, um, I think that it, it allowed me or given me, has given me the opportunity to also question things I assumed because when I went into the class, I assumed that I knew what holistic education was. So that's the danger too as educators when we assume that we know something that we really shouldn't assume that we always um, must continue to be learning. Um, so because I was on a team that developed a high school, established a high school in Cape Breton um, in a First Nation community, and we, we used that word holistic as we were developing the school. We said, well, we want it to be more than academic. We want it to be cultural, spiritual, emotional. Uh, we want to look at entrepreneurialism. We want to look at the whole person. And, and I, I can attest to um, how that does actually work, how successful it is. I wish that every school in Nova Scotia would, would look at a holistic approach to education. Uh, it, it just doesn't work in my mind when you only focus on the academic. Um, you could see students who were not thriving in the school that they were in prior to that, which focused solely on academic, you could see them thriving. You could see them becoming, um, taking an ownership over their learning, getting interested because the system that uh, the school that we had created was set up so that students could to come with ideas. They could, they had influence on um, the curriculum. They also had influence on um, hiring of teachers, which was really interesting. So um, because the relationship is so important, um, many of the First Nation students that I worked with, if they didn't feel that relationship with you, they absolutely could not learn with you. So all these things we could build into the, into the, um, into the school, into the policies, into the, the whole system. And that's the, the great thing when you work outside a, a system that's, uh, so it's not so structured that you have to, you know, it doesn't take you a year to get anything approved. You can come up with an idea and you can start it tomorrow and you can, you can build it um, based on what actually works. So taking Ashwani's course um, was interesting because I saw too the importance of dialogue. His classes, are all about dialogue. He doesn't stand up there and you know talk about turn to page 78 or any of that. It's all about dialogue and you have to contribute and it was so empowering for all the students to contribute and then it's the only class that I found that I actually knew the other students. I knew what they were doing. I knew what their ideas were about education. So that's so powerful because often the people in the room, especially at the master's level where they've worked for so many years, they have so many ideas that you know are worth sharing. So the the you know it's like the lateral transfer, sharing of information as opposed to the top down. So after that, I'm I, I have started a nonprofit and and some. Um, one of our ideas was to start a private school that would be um, not a First Nation school, of course, because I can't do that, I'm not First Nation, but it would be a holistic school, it would be inclusive. Um, so I uh, talked to Ashwani about doing um, an independent study and have uh, work on the framework for the holistic school, so I've just completed that. and so. Uh, I, I guess I'm not in the classroom. I work now just um, in my own business, working with different communities doing um, community development. But um, 
it applies to that, it applies, it, it applies to everything you do in terms of the holistic model, but that whole idea of the, <clears throat> the dialogue and the empowering of people by, by that engagement, and especially when you work with, with youth, and I've worked with youth at risk, and that engagement is so important where um, there's, a, there's a shared, uh, well, there's, there's no uh, hierarchy in terms of the power, so um, I think, uh, that whole model could be used in, in so many different ways. And I'm jumping all over the place now, because I, I really do believe that this is, this is the way to move forward in education. I heard this morning people talking about their, their experiences in service learning. It's very similar. It's, you, you get that, you, if you go into a job, you don't just focus on one thing. There's everything is going to influence you, and you're going to influence everybody else. So that whole idea of relationships, and um, I guess the big picture, so that's about all I have to say. My name is Michelle Gillis, and I uh, work in Truro at Redcliffe Middle School. I teach seventh grade students, and I have them for e ELA, English Language Arts, Social Studies, Health, and this year I'm picking up science. Um, I hope to share with you this morning just a brief overview of my teaching transformation. Um, the idea of going from a very rigid classroom structure where I'm at the front and the kids are, you know, attentively watching me and learning from me, um, going from straight lines uh, of desks to getting rid of those desks to teaching in circle to giving up the power um, position in the classroom and learning alongside my students. I spent nearly 10 years in the military before I became a teacher. So being in the Armored Corps, being in the Army, was what I thought I was going to do for my career. Uh, I had a knee injury, which meant I had to be medically released. So entering the classroom from the Army trenches was quite an experience, as you can possibly imagine. In my mind, it was going to be smooth. I was going from one set of subordinates to another. I was going from one position of power to another. But anybody who's ever taught in junior high uh, would understand that that's not the way it worked. I went in there with a heavy fist and just assumed that the kids would just listen and respect me as the classroom teacher. And oh my, it, it was not smooth. <laughs> um, I was accustomed to hierarchy. The kids were going to listen to what I was going to say. And we were just automatically going to have a relationship. I didn't realize that that relationship was going to be built on things like getting to know one another. Um, sharing stories about our lives. I went in there with every lesson scripted from the beginning, like our 42 minute periods were scripted the entire way through. Before class started, I had the video queued, I had my handouts and there was no downtime. We just went from you know curriculum outcome to curriculum outcome. And while I may have covered the outcomes and had everything efficiently done, I don't really know in those first two years how much the students actually learned. They learned to parrot, they learned to write down their answers on the paper and get that check mark. But in terms of, if I saw those students today, what do you remember from grade seven ELA? I don't think it would be very much. So I didn't really like teaching. I made this transition and here I am, career number two, a couple years in and thinking, this is not what it looked like in the movies. This is not that relationship that I thought I was going to have. I coached um, outside of school. I coached the high school students rugby. Um, and I just assumed that we would have that friendship, that collegial or that, you know, that, that joking in the hallways, and it never happened. Not that I was looking to be best friends with the students, but nobody came to hang out in my classroom at lunchtime. Nobody came to seek my advice for anything. And I just, I couldn't figure it out. I didn't know what was missing. I was the most efficient, effective teacher um, for being a new teacher. I was hitting all the, uh, you know, using all the initiatives, hitting all the, the board lingo. Um, I was, you know taking everything that the other teachers were telling me about classroom management and using it, but that relationship, that, that undercurrent was missing. So when I started my master's degree, I feel that I've changed more as a person and I've benefited more from this degree than I ever thought was possible um, in an academic setting. Uh, my courses, yes, were academic based, but there was so much of me learning who I am and how that affects the classroom that I could talk about it for hours. Uh, Parker Palmer's The Courage to Teach actually had me in tears, realizing the who of who we are as teachers is, has such a profound effect on what we do in the classroom. Um, so as I continued my, through my first two years, my true self never came through. There was that fragmentation of my private self and my self that I shared with my students. So when I, I started this course or started this degree, I took Peace and Compassion and studied under um, Sherida Hassan Ali. We went to the Thinker's Lodge in Pugwash and that was transformational. And I came back to the classroom 
still clinging to a lot of my old ideas, but came with this idea of, I'm going to teach peace and compassion. Here's my lesson plan, and I'm going to teach these kids what it means to be compassionate. Okay, so it required some work, but in doing that, in opening myself up to making the curriculum work for me, instead of me working for the curriculum, making the curriculum reflect my students and giving the students some input and that chance, as my colleagues have talked about, to reflect themselves or see themselves reflected in what I'm teaching, that opened the door and showed me what I really love about teaching is making that connection, having that relationship. And once you have that connection and that relationship, that's when the learning really begins. So um, that course started my transformation and then taking holistic education, um, taking restorative approaches, mindfulness-based education, all of those courses opened me up to this whole other perspective on what it means to be a teacher. Yes, we pay homage to the curriculum and all that sort of thing, but you can't even attempt that until you get to know your students, until you have that relationship solidly built. And I wanna be very clear that at first I thought, okay, I'll make this relationship with the kids and that'll make the delivery of the curriculum so much easier. But as soon as getting to know the kids is just another technique to cram more material down their throats, then you've lost them again because it's inauthentic. It's not that true engagement. It's not that genuine flow and share and getting to know one another. So, you know, it, it's been five years since I started this master's. I just recently finished. Um, it's been five years of growing and changing and figuring out who am I and how do I represent myself in the classroom so I can get to know the students. How can we build this classroom community where we can all learn together? And so I'm no longer at the front of the classroom. We no longer have desks. We use stability ball chairs. We have uh, clipboards because I don't need to be standing at the front of the room with them behind their desks because I am not the purveyor of all knowledge. We are learning together and this approach has completely transformed where I started and where I am today, and I'm still, still tweaking it, still fine-tuning it, and still looking forward to taking more courses, even though I'm done, to keep that quest to build those relationships, to keep that going. Usual chance to be able to hear about the paths that each speaker has taken. And I think that's a what I learned from holistic education was that the paths that you choose to take, those are your paths. And that resonated with me because when you're aware of your own path and you reflect on it, perhaps you're more uh, willing to stop and listen to other people's paths. And by doing that, I think, this is, this is again is what I, I received from taking the course with Ashwani, was that to be attentive and in the moment, you kind of have to ask yourself, what does it take for you to be attentive? Because I imagine it's different for everyone. Speaking of paths, uh, as an artist and an art teacher, I started out, like a lot of people, thinking I was going to do something different. When I was really, really young, I loved detective stories and movies, and I thought I'd like to be a detective. And I carried a notebook with me, and I wrote down information that I thought was interesting. I observed and, and thought, okay, this is the way to do it. But then I also found I was drawing pictures, too. Then I found out you had to be a police officer, and I didn't think I wanted to be a police officer. So then I thought, well, what else would I like to do? I've always liked to draw, but I didn't think I could do anything with that. So in high school, I was involved with theater, theater studies. And then I decided that's what I'd pursue and go to Dalhousie and uh, take the theater program. And that taught a lot of things to, about presentation, about uh, learning about writing, getting into a character and what makes a character, what are some of the characteristics that make a person a person? And observing, again, observing. Some of our assignments were, were to observe people we didn't know and just see physical things, nuances, the way they moved slightly. And I thought, well, I seem to like to observe and I also like writing and I like acting, but I, I still don't quite know what I want to do. Then I thought I'd travel, so I went traveling to England. 
And I lived for a year in England, and, and I, I learned some interesting things about uh, British culture. I, I uh, made friendships and relationships. I learned a little bit about myself. And when I returned, I thought, well, what else do I want to learn? Well, when I was in England, I didn't go to theater like I thought I would on my days off from my, my work. Instead, I went to art galleries. So then I thought when I returned, I'd like to pursue art. So I uh, went, to Dalhousie, or went to NASCAD University and studied painting and ceramics. And I was really amazed at how my previous degree in theater studies and learning about people, learning about the craft of writing, learning about observation helped me in my, in my fine art degree. And then after that, I, I, as I said, I focused in painting and ceramics. Initially, I went in thinking I would become a, a product designer, but that's not what, what uh, led me through my, the rest of my degree. It was painting and ceramics. I liked the tactile feeling. I liked keen observation. I liked the tactile feeling of clay. I liked the, the movement of paint. I liked the mixing of color. And then I thought, well, okay, it seems that I like keen observation, I like to use my hands. I like to create narratives. I like to create worlds in a way on canvas or, or responses to questions on canvas or, or issues. And okay, now what do I do? Well, I thought, well, I have to pay for my student loans. What will I do that's challenging, that I haven't done before, uh, that could show me another part of living? So I went to Japan. And I, and I taught for three years. Initially, I was only going to go for one. I went for three. And there, I taught English as a second language in, in elementary schools and junior highs and high schools. And talk about learning about how to be when you can't express yourself through language when you've depended on it so for so long. That's when I think I really learned more about observation and observing and listening. I had to listen very carefully to be understood, to understand, to be safe, to know where to go, where I wanted to go, how to get there, how to express myself. And I think that's an interesting way of looking at who you are, is putting yourself in a position where you don't have control, the control that you're used to. So having said all that, I came back from Japan. I started teaching at the College of, or, uh, NASCAD College of Art and Design in their extended studies program because I knew I liked teaching. At that point, the experience in Japan, I liked to teach. From there, I thought, if I love art and I love teaching, I love new experiences and meeting with people, well, then I think teaching art is probably what I'm going to pursue next. So I came to the Mount and I, um, I took the education degree here in visual arts. And that gave me the opportunity to, again, make some wonderful relationships with fellow students and faculty. And uh, then from there, with my certified teaching degree, I, I taught for three years at a private school teaching art, visual arts, from uh, grades, or for grade seven students up to grade 12 students. And that's when I had the opportunity to teach IB art as well in high school. And that allowed me to, um, because it's an extended art program, it allowed me to try and take a few risks with assignments, art assignments for, with students, in which um, they could think about their relationships uh, with themselves, with other people in the school, with uh, issues and interests of their own, um, things that concern them. And I got to know them very well through the art program. So I think the focus here was relationships, art, teaching. And then I came back to school here to do a master's in education. And I took Ashwani's course, and I thought, oh, yes, I'm a very good listener, I'm a very good observer, I'm very, you know, I can do all these things. And then I think uh, I realized halfway through the course that I had made a lot of assumptions about what I could or what I thought I could do. And it wasn't until uh, we, we read an awful lot of work by Krishnamurti. And the idea of the path you take 
knowing what you what you have done and where you're going that only you can curve it but in the sense or in the midst of that is being attentive and in the moment and that really bothered me because i thought i was and then i thought to myself um i've been trained to observe things attentively but have i really been taught to or have I really experienced how to listen attentively? And then I was thinking, I wonder if there's a way of listening aesthetically. When you observe aesthetically, you're looking at textures, you're looking at um, combinations, relationships, contrasts, rhythm, balance. And I thought, well, if I want to learn how to listen attentively, how do I do that aesthetically? So then I was thinking, well, what is it in someone's voice? When someone's speaking, they have timber in their voice, they have pitch, they have quality, they have urgency, they have pauses. And the more I thought about that, and this again was, was because of, of the course, I thought, what am I missing in, in listening? And part of it was time. I didn't take the time to stop and listen to students, like I thought I, I should. I didn't take the time to uh, listen to friends, loved ones, colleagues. So now, I, because I'm, I'm still a student developing a, a holistic educational methods or possibilities, I find myself trying to take the time to listen. And I find it very calming. The reason, of course, I'm sharing this with you today, I know I haven't talked a lot about, about classroom and, and in experiences there as much, but. Uh, the course has taught me to look, listen, be calm, and try to forget. Try to forget all the other noise around. Try to be in the moment. So if I can leave you with any impression that, that I've been left with, with holistic education, it's to be in the moment and to enjoy the moment, especially when you're speaking with someone else. Thank you. Um, I think at the master's, at the graduate level, um, to be perfectly honest, since you asked, <laughs> yeah, uh, I think individual uh, instructors could provide more of an opportunity of uh, a student-based um, learning experience. Um, and I'm only speaking for myself, I don't want to speak for anybody else, but I've noticed uh, several times um, feeling like the same old uh, education ed education experience, like I was locked in a Ziploc bag um, and expected almost to regurgitate, which kind of took me aback a little bit at the graduate level. Uh, I was hoping for um, more, um, more exploration, I think. Um, and, and it's the same, the same experience that I had in the classroom was the same experience that my students are having every classroom they go to. It's the same type of thing that we're talking about. It's that engagement and the investment. Um, and so often, um, sometimes at the graduate level, we feel like there are students who feel like they're paying for their graduate courses, um, but sometimes it can be going through the motions, which is why you find courses like Ashwani's where um, they're always full and they're in high demand because of the experience that the students have. And at this point, um, <clears throat> excuse me, in my life, at my age, um, I want an educational experience. Um, and to me, I would pay top dollar for that. I'm not sure if it's anything that you can not make mandatory or not force, but you cannot come into a course like this or take on these ideas or philosophies until you're ready. So you could present them in a Bachelor you know, of Education, but until students are in the classroom and they've had that experience of who am I and how does it reflect in my teaching, I don't think that they could necessarily get something from a course like this. So it's, it almost needs to be at the graduate level, but how do you get teachers into a course like that who may at first be a little, I don't think this is, you know, it, it's out there, it's kooky, I'm not giving up my desks or I'm not gonna hug my students, anything like that, but to show them that self-reflection and knowing um, who you are and what you bring to the classroom is so important. So that's a really great question and I think maybe having these conversations with more teachers 
um, sitting down and just engaging in that dialogue, listening to people's stories to try to figure out how do we help teachers become who they truly are. But I don't think it's necessarily by offering more courses because you're only gonna get those of us who are already excited about it enrolling in those courses. It's how do we reach those other people? More dialogue. Uh, can I just add one thing too is uh, one thing I recently read uh, was the idea of um, fearlessness. Uh, how many teachers, and I think we've, we've heard about some of the, the fears and uh, assumptions and biases or prejudice some people have, have had in the past and as a result of service learning or of holistic education, they've changed. So one way, perhaps, is for um, people to, uh, people who are educators, maybe to think about what their fears are about teaching, and maybe personally as well. And some fears could be personal fears about uh, um, family issues or, or not being able to um, uh, provide or, uh, or not being able, and professionally not being able to teach what you want or when you want or, uh, or, or whether, uh, whatever fears that you face, if, if, if people are encouraged, I guess, to maybe confront them a little bit, then in the classroom, I'm thinking that with that, that sense of fearlessness, there might be a more confidence, more openness to put aside some of the um, s structures of what you think you should be like in a classroom and really embrace, for example, what Michelle did where you start thinking about how you personally want to be in the classroom. That, that's one suggestion anyway. Facing on fearlessness. <laughs> Can I also say one point? I think that that to me is the essential, the, the significance of self-inquiry. What One question that we might ask is, is the purpose of university education uh, enhance people's self-understanding of themselves? Self-understanding not only in the sense that I want this career or that career, I want this job or that job, but truly exploring themselves. I don't think that is a very significant part of school education, nor do I think that that is a very important part of university education. And the, many people have asked me, so okay, can you give us a curriculum that we can implement? And I said that it, it can't work in, in that fashion, that I designed something and then you are going to implement it in, in your schools. It can only be learned through engagement. And that's what I did in my class. And that's what I will recommend to anybody who is interested in uh, creating a dialogical classroom that comes with giving significance to self-understanding. Unless you understand yourself, and has the willingness to engage in a dialogical exploration with other, uh, that kind of a community or that kind of a transformi transformative engagement is not possible. So to me, self-inquiry is the essence of education.